Mau kau kau? Oh, oh my ka ike ike papa lua e. Ho my ka i ini i ini papa lua e. Ho my ka mana mana papa lua e. Ho my, ho my, ho my ka papa lua e. E ola. Ho my ka ike ike papa lua e. Ho my ka i ini i ini papa lua e. Ho my ka mana mana papa lua e. Ho my, ho my, ho my ka papa lua e. E ola. Ho my ka ike ike papa lua e. Ho my ka i ini i ini papa lua e. Ho my ka mana mana papa lua e. Ho my. Ho my, ho my, ka papa lua e, e ola. So mahalo everyone again, welcome for joining us. So our, our agenda for today, um, we're going to have a, a mo'olelo from Auntie Tammy Smith about Ulu and, and, her, and her family's deep, deep connection. And then Anna uh, Ezi will show us a wonderful new toolkit that a couple of the teachers who are on this call actually helped to create. Kapua is one of them. Um, and then I'll briefly share about uh, Palaai Kabocha Squash. Then we'll take a short break so that people can get ready to cook. Yeah. Then we'll start off with the Ulu pasta with Elise Barthel, our youth chef. And then the, the, the dish has to rest a little bit. So when the, the ulu pasta dish is resting, we will then switch to Abby Langless and she will then share her recipes. Then we'll come back <laughs> to the ulu pasta after it's rested a bit with Elise. And then we will, um, then we'll close, okay? It is a pleasure to call upon um, Auntie Tammy Hoy Smith, who is from uh, Oahu, and she is an Ulu ambassador with the Ulu Co-op. Oh, and I'm wearing my Ulu Co-op. I don't know if you guys. Can. <laughs> it says I'm a revolutionary chef. Um, so I got to know Auntie Tammy through Donna Shapiro, the manager of the Hawaii Ulu Co-op, and I really wanted her to share with you the mo'olelo of her family, her family and her family's deep connection to one of the most important foods we have, I think in the world, but especially for us here as, as stewards of Hawaii, what is our responsibility? So without any further ado, I'm going to pass the time to Auntie Tammy. Okay, aloha everybody. My mo'u, my place of Hakipu'u where I am, uh, a descendant of uh, definitely on our Kealoha line, uh, which is my grandma, my grandma Lucy Kealoha. Um, Ho, actually H O E, yeah. So um, most, a lot of you know my dad, Uncle Herbert Ho, my uncle Calvin Ho. Um, that's our definitely our Chinese side, yeah. But um, for us guys as Kanaka, our, our lineage is to our Kealoha. Uh, Koko to Hakipu'u and, and we are my grandchildren are now sixth generation living in Hakipu'u yeah? uh, so we are very blessed um, by my grandma and uh, my great grandpa so with that being said our, our story about Ulu is, is a very uh, real story yeah in Hakipu'u uh, in the time of old is where during Makahiki season, everybody came in to Hakipu'u um, and to learn and to put down their guards. It was the time of peace, right? And in that time of peace, our navigator, Kaha'i, had come home from Samoa, yeah? And in his time of coming home to Samoa, to Hakipu'u, he had brought in our ulu trees, yeah? So he he planted the first ulu tree in Hakipu'u. And uh, 
in today's time, in our yard uh, in Hakipu'u, we have one of those trees that is one of the oldest in, in our genealogy, in, in, in our recollection, in my dad's recollection in his recollection that that tree has always been there before his time. So we have two new trees, uh, two coconut trees and this one ulu tree that has, is way older than my dad. Um, and when we look at pictures, which is very few um, in my grandma's time, we see those coconut trees and we see the ulu tree yeah, in the background. So. So we can connect that to the place, yeah? But if you go Mauka from our place, because we live more Makai of Hakipu'u. Um, and if you know Oahu, um, when I say Hakipu'u, Hakipu'u is very small, just one real small space. Um, so when you come in Kaneohe, you come into Kahalu'u, you come into Ka'alaya, and then you come into Waiahole, yeah? And then you're going to come into Waikane. Yeah, when you come into Waikane, you're going you're going to come into Hakipu. The signs say Kulo Ranch. Yeah. But in the beginning between Waikane and Hakipu. Uh, but the markers say Hakipu. And once you pass, there's a little touristy stop called Coral Kingdom. And then if you go a little bit over a small bridge in Hakipu, you can come Johnson Road. And right when you pass Johnson Road, you're going to come into Kualoa. You, you think you're in Kualoa, but you're actually not in Kualoa. You are still in Hakipu'u, yeah? But if you go Kualoa Park, yeah? And then you go in the backside, you're going to see one Ahu, right? This is now where all the Hokulea events happen and where Hokulea was birthed and launched in this, in 76. Um, there's an Ahu over there, and that is our marker to tell us that that's the line between Kualoa and Hakipu'u. Yeah, so if you look Makai, you're going to see, you're going to see the Ahu. If you look Mauka, Kanihualani is the Mauka. Yeah, Kanihualani is the line between Hakipu'u and Kualoa and Hakipu'u and Waikane. Waikane side, the mountain on that side is called Pu'upu'el. It's on black rock, Mauka but it's called Pu'upu'el. The Mauna in Hakipu'u is Ohulihuli. Yeah, so, um, and Ohulihuli is about the winds in Hakipu'u, yeah, it, it's all about the winds. Um, and in our space of Hakipu'u, um, it's very important because the kahunas live there, the teachers all live there in, in, in our time of old. And when people came in uh, during Makahiki season, all the sales went down, all the, you know, the wars stopped. And that's when people came to heal, people came to celebrate, people came to be taken care of, yeah. So um, in our Ulu story, in our Ulu history, uh, Kahai, who is our Ohana, brought in uh, the Ulu tree into Hakipu'u. He implanted the first Ulu trees all in Hakipu'u, and there is still, Mauka of us in Hakipu'u um, uh, get planting ulu trees up there. And, but there is a grove that we, uh, in our Puna area that we take care of as Ohana. And we, we always go, go check them out. We go get keiki. Um, we plant them where um, we feel our uh, Ohana is extending to. Um, and uh, so these trees are, are our kupuna. Uh, and that's how I, I seriously take my kuleana. And so in my business, yeah, as I became an adult, as I opened my business of Kalike Aloha, um, my logo is um, the ulu, yeah. So, and I, 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 I take that as a very seriously kuleana because I do food and I do food for our lahui, like that is my first, yeah, that is, that is where my strength come from. That is why I believe that ulu is the most precious food and that it takes care of multitudes of people. It is not just for, you know, just one consumption, right? It's about, that is our, in time of famine, that is what took care of our people, yeah? 
We all know that story. And we all have claim to the Ulu tree. We all have our own history in our own moku, in our own spaces that how we have relationship to the Ulu tree. So for us as the Kealoha Ohana, we look at the Ulu tree as our lineage to the place, to the food, to the kuleana, yeah? So my kuleana to me was at my, before my birth, yeah? So fortunate enough for me that I was the chosen one, yeah? So um, I am who I am today because of that kuleana. Um, I've been in food service business uh, for 30, over 35 years, yeah? Um, I get some uh, school background, but my biggest mentor in my life is my dad. Yeah. So, um, that kuleana become very, very heavy in in my everyday walk, right? So, um, so our history, our connection to Ulu is our DNA straight to the Ulu tree. Yeah, we believe. So all of our, all of our pico, all of that is in that Ulu tree. Yeah, because my father will go bury all of our pico under that tree. Um, my grandchildren, all the pico stay in Mauka uh, uh, under the Ulu tree. Yeah. So those are deep connections. That is seriously deep connections when you want to be responsible for something that is very important to our people. So we take that seriously, um, you know, for my dad, um, you know, he 80, 83 years old already, you know, so, but he still get, he get lots of memories about it. Um, he get, he still get um, plenty for teach me. Um, and in my work today, um, besides owning my own business for, over 30 years, um, it's already transferred over to my oldest son. Halike Aloha belongs to my oldest son now. But um, before 20 years ago, I developed my own school lunch program um, with the Department of State, uh, DOE. Yeah? So we're in compliance with uh, federal regulations. Um, our, our school lunch menus meet all requirements for um, federal monies. Um, but I wanna, in my lifetime, I, I feel I wanna take this to another step. Yeah, I wanna be federally recognized as indigenous people's food. Yeah, and do it for our whole entire state of Hawaii. Uh, but to be that person, to be the lead in that and to go 100% indigenous foods into our school lunch system. Right now we are about 75% into the school lunch system. Um, indigenous foods, yeah. So we use not only ulu, kalo ulu, sipotero, lao, poio, um, all of that starches um, is our food. Uh, and I, every day there's something in a menu. So, so I can say at least 75% of our menu is designed around our indigenous foods. It, it gets difficult because of the requirements, but I feel if we can surpass that and we can get to the next level, then we tell them what we like. Yeah, they don't need to tell us what we like or what's good for us. Yeah, because the standard American diet actually spells SAD, S-A-D, standard American diet. Yeah, so that's the saddest diet we can ever give our children. Yeah, but we're giving them because why? Because that's what the government tells us, but I'm not into government too much. Yeah, I, I, I like breaking barriers. I like going against all the rules. I love it because I need to stand up for us as our people, yeah. And if it's through food, I'm going to get them, right? I'm going to do them. So I, I kind of, the rebel in disguise in, the, in that world, um, I push, push, push. Uh, in my work today, I take a kupuna, yeah, at Luna Lilo Home. So I actually work at Luna Lilo Home and I uh, take care of Kupuna and I have brought to this space also um, Aipono diet, yeah, which is our food we bring. So I just, we just implant one ulu tree. It's about two years old here at Luna Lilo Home um, and we stay in Hawaii Kai, yeah. So kind of like desert over here, but the 
but our tree is taking well over here. Um, I think so next year, but our third year, we're going, we probably going fruit. As I look at the tree, as I talk to the tree and I, I tell my tree, like, come on, we got, we, you know, like, I get planted coconuts, you know, and, and I feel it's my coconut that helping me for grow this tree. It's very full um, for a three-year-old tree, you know, like, I feel like, oh, this bugger is going to give me pretty soon, you know what I mean? Like, like I feel like that coconut tree is in a rush as much as I am in a rush to feed our people. So it, it, it's just a good feel. It's kind of like my own way of thinking and, but community they know me right so they know i, I use planet ulu they drop them off by the by the loads when their trees is all all full you know people bring them and they say hey auntie you can use ulu shoots yep i can and i process them you know and i leave them in my freezer so every day if i need i get i make anything from soup to dessert you know with the ulu um it, ulu is viable to everybody um, and it is the most healthiest I feel and it's the most that it it will really take care of people um, if if we're talking about we run on, out of food we can feed people ulu you know because get plenty yeah but we because we don't know how for process and people get afraid of the processing that we stay away from it but in the whole Pacific island right we all know ulu yeah, and everybody think, oh, only the Samoans eat ulu. Like, oh, no, you know, it belongs to us guys too, you know, and we all have to just, we eat it differently, but we all have a connection to ulu. So it's your relationship, yeah? We're talking about relationship. So, and, and in my style of cooking, it is about relationship to the food. I truly believe that helps me to be who I am. It helps me to process the things that I need to process. It helps me to believe um, that the work I'm doing is correct because I have a relationship with Ulu. Yeah, so um, um, maybe a little bit out of the box or maybe a little bit strange to some um, in, in in my field, but yeah, food connections are, are critical. Yeah, um, and, and me, I chance them. You know, like I got the box, right? You know, I had the kabocha had the ulu you know what i mean but um when i get the box i actually had to do a um, food demonstration for kaiser hospital not the hospital but kaiser clinic when open one brand new clinic in kapole and i had to go down there and i was like oh shoot so i'm gonna take this then so i ended up making a vegetarian lao lao with everything that was in the box yeah i only went add tofu and then i went use one um the kai choi uh, for the wrap yeah, so, so well, you know, and then I had this opportunity to actually cook for the leaders of Kaiser Permanente from California. Yeah, so that's all doctors, right? You know, that's all the guys that make the decisions for Kaiser and, and had about um, six of them. And, you know, I make lao lao, plaza, and go make uh, vegetarian kind lao lao with, with the box because I had them. Right, so I was like, "Wow, oh, shucks, I go use them right now." So anyway, I'm gonna make them, and out of the six people that came, three of them took the vegetarian one, yeah, and they would taste them, and they they was like, "Wow, what is this?" So I name everything inside, and I said, "But this is ulu," and you know, explain who ulu is to me, and and they just was like in awe, and I um that experience with that, and knowing that the level of people that I was cooking for and in the space that we're cooking is to bring good health to our people yeah and and Kaiser taking this lead in the next generation of technology and health but they doing indigenous health in communities so what better way to get them to buy in to indigenous health indigenous health includes indigenous foods and gotta come from the indigenous people yeah no can be like you can hire somebody outside but tell us as Kanaka how to cook ulu, right? That come from us. So, so I felt really good about this this project. Um, ulu takes me all over the place. Ulu gets me feeling all, all kinds of feels. Depends what situation I'm in, um, but it definitely keeps me grounded. In my school lunch programs, we, you know, we put ulu in anything and everything we can possibly think of, right? You know, kids is kids. They like eat what they like eat, but we, we rock them with the ulu. And, you know, so, you know, we do one, um, you know, 
he's like, uh, you know, nacho salad, right? But I make ulu chips then, yeah? We make ulu chips with them, right? And then we chop them all inside, cook them with the hamburger, you know, and, and just so that they no forget what tastes like, yeah? So kids, you know, because if the kids like it, then the parents will like them. And then with the charter schools that we do cook for, we actually have monthly um, cooking classes with them. Of course, 2020 was the unique year of everybody jumping on Zoom and learning and schools was all over the place. We actually shut down the, the business for 2020 because we had no schools open. But what we did was, and with the schools, we, we really checked in on families. And if they, we gave them opportunity for jump on Zoom if they wanted to. Um, we did a family cooking program with schools and um, just, just kind of help break the monotonous or if parents was running out of things for well, feed the kids and just kind of help them and just be there, um, talk story mostly with, with families. And um, so the Kuleana to Ulu is real, right? That's, that's my, my biggest thing on, on, this, on this panel is um, when you look at Ulu, you should think about me, right? I mean, that's how I, I, I look at um, the, the world that I feed. Um, and, you know, we, we fought for Mauna Kea, yeah, you know, we had all these rallies. Um, in the biggest rally down in um, in 2019, yeah, um, we went Waikiki, yeah, 20,000 people we didn't feed. I didn't feed them, yeah. And what we did was Aina Momona Stu. What is Aina Momona Stu? We start with Haloa, Aokalo, yeah, so we make Luau, yeah. We put inside Uala. We put in the ulu, yeah, and, and we didn't even have meat inside. We only gave them our food, yeah, and all that's all we went serve. For 20,000 people, we went serve Aino Momono stool because I felt if we're going to fight for land, we're going to fight for this. This is what land is about. This is about our food, our culture. It identifies us guys as people, and we don't need rice. We don't need nothing else. We're only going to I know my mom to, and that is the after walking for a couple of miles, right? You come, you you hungry, little bit hungry. People of all whatever, you know, not only Kanakas that were in March, but people that came through and realized like, oh wow, like you know, and I realized that even our Kanaka people don't really understand the value of our food too. And so we were able to educate people like why we only did that and we never make chili and hot dog. You know, we made I know my mono stool because you know they they willing for buy, they willing for pay for chili and hot dog. But because we did Ulu and you know, and I know my mono stool, people kind of were like, Oh, I don't know. You know, and I we encourage people to take home, you know, and then they finally realize like why are they marching then? What you what you cool air about then? If you're not fighting for this, then what you cool air about, right? So lots of education. I uh, was was good fun. Um, for me, that's what I do. Um, in my world today, as I service my kupuna here at Luna Lila Home, I bring all this food back to them because it was in in the lifespan. Yeah, you know, we they kind of at the final time here at Luna Lila Home. I go give them the best. And what is our best? We'll give them kalo. We're going to give them ulu. We're going to give them uala. We're going to make fish. We're going to do what is us. Yeah. We don't need to give them canned goods. We don't need to go, you know, we should buy fresh food. So we grow a lot of food over here. You know, I mean, we grow squash. We grow eggplant. We grow mamaki tea. We get lemongrass. We get papaya. We get banana tree. But this is all brand new to Luna Lilo Home. Only two years old. Yeah, since we grow food, but I tell you, our, our garden, our mala has given us more than um, enough. We were able to share some of that food up on the Mauna to those kupuna. When I was able to spend some time up there cooking for one week up at, on the Mauna, I go give those guys a break and um, we go kuku up there and, and really take food seriously and how, how I look at food differently. I'm a very different kind of person. I'm a very different kind of cook. Um, I don't like to be called chef because uh, it's only title. I, I don't mind people call me Auntie Tammy, you know, but uh, chef, I don't relate to the word too good, you know, because I don't feel I earned that title yet, you know, but call me Auntie, I good, you know. So um, 
in my world. I love it. I love my kuleana. I love what I do, and I I'm I'm pleased to share today um, my story. My kuleana to Ulu um, is my life. It's my birthright. It's my um, you know it's my DNA. Uh, it is who I am. It is and and um, I like to know that I get to leave a legacy with my own children. Yeah, I'm a mom of four, um, four, 11 kids. I get 11 keiki, I get 15 grandkids. Yeah, so um, I always get on big pot. Yeah, no worry, I can cook, you know. So cooking now for only get three of us left in our house, you know, only get me my, you know, my, my husband and our youngest son, everybody else, adults, get their own, you know, thing going on. Our oldest son actually live in our home in Hakipu'u and he raising his children there. So they the, my grandchildren are the sixth generation in on our property. Um, so it's, it's amazing. Um, I get to live where I work. So it, it's, it's a little nicer to be close to work. So, and I love working like three o'clock in the morning kind of time because it's my time. I get to connect to my kupuna at that time. Um, every day, it's a blessing. Even in COVID, yeah. In COVID time in 2020, from Luna Lilo home, we um, did over 200,000 community meals service from here, only to kupuna. Only to kupuna, it wasn't for families, it was actually for kupunas. So we, and we still have some um, big numbers going out into the community weekly with Hawaii Meals on Wheels. So I cook for them. Every Monday they pick up a thousand frozen meals for me. Um, and then we have a daily program. Um, so it within a week, it just for, and Luna Lilo is a very small kitchen. We no more big kitchen and we only get three employees on a shift every day. Um, and we rock the food, I mean, and coming out solid and I, I pushed the agenda of Luau and Ulu and all of that in, in every day because that's what we should be doing. Um, I, I don't like to do the other kind of food, you know, because yeah, everybody else doing them, you know, so I stay me, um, I stay within my kuleana and uh, it's mahalo for having me today, you know, a little bit talk story and, and uh, kind of check the kids out, how they doing, you know, and the ulu flower, I just want to get back to that part, you know, knowing that the bug going to rise, yeah, you know, and everybody kind of get your off, yeah, like when they're using ulu flower, like, oh, the, you know, the thing stay flat. I say, oh, hello, the thing no more on rise or inside, you know, is ulu flower, you know, so just mix them, you know, and, and do 50-50, you know, so um, I went go make kind, um, uh, what is that, cream, cream puff, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm use the ulu flour. Yeah, so I'm gonna make cream puff um, with the with the overripe ulu. Yeah, I'm gonna mix them with uh, cream cheese. Yeah, and I'll make the filling. Yeah, with the because it's sweet. Yeah, I mean, get a different taste, you know. And so what I do with the overripe ulu, I bake them and I let them a little bit pop up. Yeah, so all the caramelization start to happen. Yeah, and then I process the whole thing with the skin on. I run them through the blender. Yeah, wet skin on. No, take them off because that's where all the sweets stay, actually. Yeah, so in the overripe, the things stay in the skin. And I just let them get a little bit, you know, pop up. I, I run them through the machine. And then when as I need them, I use them for, on, I, for dessert. So I make plenty, you know, mix them with uh, cream cheese. Check them out. Mix them with pudding, maybe, you know. Just, just check them, try them, you know. No can, no can be wrong, you know, no can be wrong, you know, like, you don't know, so, but that's, that's like, um, and then one other one was, I'm going to make an ulu muffin, yeah, and I'll put kulolo inside the middle. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that, so that overripe ulu, yeah, it's I mix good. them into my muffin mix, and then I went kind. So, you know, you pipe them into the pan, and put one. Kulolo piece, one good chunk, kulolo piece inside, pipe the rest on top. So when the thing bake, the thing stay in the middle. When you bite them, get the kulolo inside. Oh. So the thing is, yeah, was the winners, was the winners. I mean, like, I mean, you know, you guys send me product, I use them, you know, and, and, and like, we got to encourage, like, 
kind of guys drop off Ulu, but you know, all kinds of different stage, sometimes just way over right, but I use them all. I don't throw in nothing. Yeah, you know, you clean them, you just make make them work. Yeah, because all usable. The whole fruit is usable. Yeah, you just got to know how to process them. And good fun. Um, I lucky because my dad, you know, he lived Molokai. Molokai get loaded ulu too. Yeah, so my dad, when planning guys, they give him, he, he steam them, he clean them, he, he process them for me, he cut them in, in chunks, he leave them whole, he he, he shred them, you know, because he know I use them all different kind of style. And, and then he freeze them. And then we send home one whole kula of ulu from Molokai. You know, when my dad get chance to fill up on kula, so good fun. But yeah, so that's my rant. That's my rage. You know, that's my craziness of, of who I am. And um, I love what I do, for sure. Um, yeah. I love sharing. Um, it's no secret. Recipes, yeah, for me, it's, it's about your kuleana first. Mm. Recipes, when you get one on one pepper, that's a guideline. Yeah, mm -hmm. tweak them a little bit here and there. You, you know, you come up with something brand new all the time. Out of time, so uh, I encourage uh, the the user use, use Ulu. It's all good. All good. Yeah. Well, mahalo. Mahalo, mahalo, Nuilo, yep. Auntie Tammy. But um, again, mahalo, Tammy, so much for your mm -hmm. for your your inspiring story and just the numbers, the sheer numbers of two hundred thousand meals. I cannot even wrap my brain around that. And how true you are, you know, what you said about the work of learning to cook and learning to process. So I know the dream that Donna has for the Hawaii Ulu Co-op is that there are similar co-ops on, on every island. Mm -hmm. And this yep. way that we can help people process. Mm -hmm. Not everybody mm -hmm. knows yep. how, not everybody has the time. And like you say, if you can receive it, you know, in a, in a package like that, wow, it makes it so much easier. Yeah, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. makes it so much easier to um to to use it. And then also some of the work that I want to get our attendees to support us in doing is, um, Ulu is accepted by the USDA, um, the Hawaii. Food Nutrition Services, ULU is accepted as a whole grain substitute. Yeah, yeah. But not UALA. So our next yeah. task, so the work that ULU Co-op really pushed hard in our community, now you can use ULU instead of bread. Okay, now we yeah. accept that in Hawaii schools. Next job is to make sure UALA is on that list. Other, other island nations like Samoa, all those, they have accepted uala, sweet potatoes, as a whole grain substitute, but not Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. So, in our school, so in our school lunch program, definitely that's, that's been our biggest push. Um, and, you know, like um, I give credit to Dr. Claire Hughes, who is one of our pioneer leaders in actually even getting um, hoi designated as, as a starch into our school lunch system. So um, lots of leg work before our time. Yeah, yeah. before our time, Dr. Kekuni Blaze Dell, my dad, Uncle Herbert Ho, um, but mm -hmm. Dr. Um, definitely Dr. Claire Hughes played a big part in adding that all into um, the nutrition books uh, to be accepted by the USDA. Um, and then she even helped uh, Samoa to put yes. uh, in, in, in the book, so to be uh, counted. So, yep, so lots of legwork before our time. In our time, we still get plenty more work for do. Mm -hmm. So um, as a group and as a collective, uh, people that care about food, we got to push forward. So mahalo. Mahalo, Nui Noa. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. So glad you could join us. I do want to uh, move us on to uh, Anna Ezzi, since we're talking about Ulu and education. Anna will share with us really briefly about the new Ulu Education Toolkit. Um, so over to you, um, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you, Auntie Tammy, for that awesome sharing. OK. Hi, everyone. So um, this is kind of like a sneak peek of the Ulu Education Toolkit. We're going to formally launch in uh, mid to late April, so coming out very soon. But this is like exclusive sneak peek. Um, so this is actually the toolkit guide page, which is kind of like the front piece for the, um, the toolkit. And it 
talks about the contributors. So um, this is a collaboration between the Ulu Co-op, um, the Hawaii Fonta School, Hui, and also STEM Squared um, at UH, and many other contributors. We have a list of the full list of contributors. Um, you can explore more, but this guide is basically um, sharing our intention and um, just a lot of context for teachers going into this guide who might not be very familiar with Ulu or be very familiar with Ulu. So for a range of users. Um, and we have just some certain, it's actually um, under a Creative Commons license. So you're free to use any materials in the toolkit, images, any content. We just have um, some certain terms that are listed at the bottom. And so once you agree to those, you can go into the actual toolkit. And this is what it looks like. Um, basically, it's a living database. Um, and each resource actually has a um, place for educators or users to discuss and add in real time their comments or how to tweak the lessons or expand on the lessons or whatever the, we have different types of resources. So yeah, we basically, you can search in this keyword search um, or you can either search by keyword or you can choose your learner level. So say you pick six to eighth grade middle school. And then we also have each um, resource tagged according to the themes, the four themes of the Hawaii School Garden curriculum map. Mingwei, cheers. <laughs> yeah, those are extremely interesting. And um, so let's just pick theme three, nourishment. And then we have different types. So ranging from kind of quick or supplementary resources all the way to entire lesson or unit plans. Um, but let's, let's pick recipes since we're talking about cooking. And then we also have everything tagged with um, detailed content standards. Um, these are, so you can search by content standards. So I'm gonna select math. And then, so these, um, all the resources that are popping up now apply to all these checks. So then once you click on a resource, um, you can see the tags, all the grade levels that it's been tagged with, all the content standards. And we have this, oops. so you agree to the terms of use again, if you haven't already. So this is the detailed standards list. Um, and then we have, here's the actual resource. So this is like a standardized recipe form, actually. I believe this was developed by high school students at Kealakehe High School, if I'm not mistaken. And then here's the educator discussion, Whoop, if I can get to it, oh. is um, actually on Jamboard. And so this is where there's instructions. You can use different sticky notes. And yeah, this is just always going to be changing and adapting and we'll hopefully be adding new resources all the time. Um, yeah, I was going to go back to the guide to share this email. We have like a, if you have any questions, we have this email open, ulueducationtoolkit at gmail.com that you can send any questions to. And I also have a form that I'll post in the chat for any teachers who want to join our kind of pilot hui. Um, yeah, I'll send that link in shortly. But if there's anything else you guys want to see or any questions, let me know. My name is Mingwei. I'm the eco literacy educator with Center for Getting Things Started. And I partner all the time with the Hawaii school, um, sorry, Hawaii Farm to School Hui. And on my uh, Moko Okeave on our island of Hawaii, I partner with the Hawaii Island School Garden Network. And one of our model school gardens is the Malaai Garden at Waimea Middle School up in Waimea. So here you see Miss Holly, who is the garden educator with the sprawling, amazing vines. Yeah. You can see the beautiful sprawling vines of kabocha. The different names of it. So then the nutritional value provides vitamins A, C, B vitamins. As most of us on this call are ladies, 
And you know, B vitamin is really important for us, yeah? To have this good uh, B vitamins. And even the seeds, any kind of pumpkin seed, you know, contain a, a, a significant amount of zinc. Again, very important for us. So there's many stories about the name, but the story I love um, is that the word kabocha sounds like the word Cambodia, Cambo, you know? Um, and the, one of the stories was that the Portuguese brought the kabocha to Japan and the Japanese mistakenly called it, thought it was from Cambodia, Kabocha, Cambodia, Cambodia, uh, because that was the last stop the Portuguese came from. So funny. So that was the story. But so they called that 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 squash, Cambodia abobora, which the Japanese then renamed to be Kabocha. So that was that's one of my favorite legends about how you know Cambodia, Kabocha got its name, but it originated in in the Americas. Um, so all the squashes grow easily from seeds. So this is, I'm hoping you can see the little bee. That the, all the squashes, kabocha, all the squashes, pumpkins, all grow easily from seeds and they need pollinators. But as you know, they're very promiscuous plants. In fact, those of you who are interested in genetics, if you wanna do some Googling and look at the genetics of pumpkins and squashes, very, very fascinating genetics how they used to have like four um, different genes creating it. And now they're down to just two. It's really fascinating. So because of that, they're very promiscuous. This is the word that um, Miss Amanda Ryu of Mala Eye Garden likes to use. It means they, they, they hybrid easily. So if a bee comes from one type of your pumpkin or squash and you go to the other, the seed you get may well not be true to the parent. If you really want to keep that strain, you got to grow your other varieties of squashes and pumpkins somewhere else because they really love making different kinds of children, <laughs> right? So that's that's who they are, yeah. They're just a, a, a very love, very promiscuous plant. So here's Miss Holly again. And I wanted to show you, see how this one is green. I'm learning how to eat them at this stage. Because we, I'll show you a picture at the end. We get bumper crops, man. Like we got 20, 30 pumpkins of us giving them away, you know? So at the stage that Miss Holly is holding it in very green, it, um, you can cook it more like a zucchini. So we've been learning how to grill it at this stage. So just get it young. They're soft to cut into um, and grill it like zucchini or just substitute, like make uh, adobo uh, pork with this at this level, yeah, substitute any kind of like zucchini or whatever with the younger kabochas. But normally this is when they're ready to be harvested. You, you see how it, it has this layer of like this um, white, yeah, on it. So this is when it's like, ah, oh, sweet, delicious, ready to go, okay. Ah, so some of you have said you really like this picture. Some of you have been in some of our webinars before. So again, Miss Amanda trained her squash vines to grow up her hedge. Because some of you will say, man, my squash vines go all over the place. When I'm weed whacking, I don't know what to do with my vines. So notice how she's got it going and notice like this little guy hanging here and she's got a close up. So she's training it up to grow her hedge like on the, on the fence, yeah, on the hedge. And see how it's just hanging down from, <laughs> from the vine. Okay, this is my garden. I let it go all over. I use my kabocha squash as a living mulch. I have a small mamaki farm and you see how she is, is, is at the bottom. Just, just I, I live in Lower Puna, so all I have is a'a. Uh -uh. I have to build soil. So I'm really using these rigorous vines. I just smoosh them in as a living mulch. I step on them, I help, they help me make more soil. And as you see, I'm trying my best to grow some kalos. I, I, I have this mix where I have my kabocha with the kalo, with the mamaki in the side. Again, just as a living mulch, where you see all these orange flags are like my baby mamakis. But the idea is, because I'm in Puna and it's black, ah, uh -uh, gets really hot. And my mamaki doesn't like to get that hot. 
you know, I got to use it like a living mulch. And then just to close, um, here's the bumper crop. So again, we're learning how to use it young because look at how many we can get at a time. So my, my husband's really happy because he likes food. <laughs> and um, so again, with the, with the squash, you, know, you can really, really get a, a bumper crop and you can make so many delicious things with it. So take about five minutes, be back in about five minutes and, and be ready to cook along with our two chefs, um, our youth chef, Elise, and our uh, other Ulu ambassador chef, um, Abby from Leewood Community College. Um, but yeah, this is some examples of the Ulu pasta that we're gonna make today. It's probably a bit thicker than the pasta you're used to, but only by a little bit. And it's a great replacement or we're using half all-purpose flour and half ulu flour. So it's really a great mix of the two. So I'm I'm ready to get started. So we, for the pasta, you need salt, um, all-purpose flour, and ulu flour, which is awesome because it's from the ulu co-op. And that's really all you need for the pasta. Some optional things would be, I'm adding a little bit of turmeric just for color because it makes it more of like a yellow color and not, um, it, it, it turns more gray, which is totally fine. It's, it doesn't change the taste at all. It's just for like a peel. And then also it's optional if you wanna add some herbs so that the pasta has some like mixed in herbs. It gives it some color, which I really like. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started. So you will need a, oh, I'm doing, a serving for two people. So if you're doing for four or for six, then you double or triple the recipe. But for two people, you're gonna do half a cup of all-purpose flour. And then you're gonna do half a cup of the ulu flour. And I would be a little bit careful when putting in your ulu flour, because it's quite powdery. So you don't want to like throw it in your bowl, you want to place it quite gently because otherwise it'll just like all poop up. Um, and then you're going to take a teaspoon of salt. And a teaspoon of turmeric. Mine's um Mine's a shake bottle, so I'm just gonna eyeball it. Just totally fine. You can add as much as you'd like to. Um, just about a teaspoon is good. And then you wanna mix all of your dry ingredients. So I just have like a fork here and I'm just mixing them all so that it's all one color. Um, and you can see like the all-purpose flour is a little bit lighter in color. So you'll be able to tell when it's all incorporated. And then optionally, I, as I mentioned earlier, you can add some herbs. So I just have some chopped parsley, oregano, and thyme from my garden. And I'm just gonna add about a teaspoon of it, just a little bit for color, because I love presentation. <laughs> and then you just wanna mix that in and you won't really be able to see it in this stage because it gets very coated by the flour but it'll look very pretty at the end when you're serving. So now that's all incorporated, you're gonna, I start with a quarter cup size and you're gonna slowly add water and incorporate it into your flour. And you don't wanna add it all at one time because it'll be way too much water and then it'll just like pool. Um, so I'm gonna start with a quarter cup and you're probably gonna need a few of these, but you really just wanna add it at like a very slow stream. And it's gonna look very crumbly, but it's really cool because like, I believe it's because of the ulu flour, when you like mix it all together and you start using your hands, it really starts to just like incorporate very nicely. So it'll look a little crumbly and separated, but it'll, it'll, all, come, it'll all work out in the end. So here, I'll show you guys. I've added a quarter cup and that is what it looks like. It's still quite crumbly and the flour definitely is not incorporated. So we're gonna add some more water. Okay. 
this recipe is also very interesting because like whenever you're making pasta, it depends on your altitude and humidity. So you're gonna need to add more or less water than I'm using. So really you'll just be able, I'll show you what it looks like in the end when I've added enough water so you guys can see. And then once we start kneading, then you can also add some more flour or add some more water depending on what your pasta needs. So, so please, you're up in Ahualoa, which is, you're about 2,000 feet, yeah? Yeah, we're pretty high up. So, so I never knew this. So depending on how high you are or low you are, you, you, you have different water needs. Wow, I'm learning something new. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's really cool. Pasta is like a little background about me. Pasta is like my favorite thing to make, um, especially handmade pasta. And if any of you guys have a pasta machine, this will be probably a lot easier. Um, but I'm rolling out by hand. So if anyone, you're also going to need a rolling pin and a cutting board or a flat surface that's clean. So just some forewarning. So that is three quarters of a cup of water. And that is what the pasta looks like. It's pretty crumbly, but they're in much bigger chunks now. So I'm actually gonna start kneading it and then we'll be able to see if we need more water or more flour or anything like that. Um, so really you just want, oh, before you do any of this, you should wash your hands. And if you haven't already, I've washed them before you, you know, touch the dough. Um, but you're really just gonna, I just start pressing it in the bowl and just really, I use my hand in like a, in like a flip motion, I guess. And you just want to incorporate all the flour together with the water. And you'll be able to see it. it's really nice because the oogle flour allows it to be really smooth and it's really soft. So it incorporates quite nicely. And if you think that it is, if it doesn't come together right away, you might want to add some more water if it's too crumbly. And you'll be able to feel it. it'll be super dry and it won't have like any moisture. So then you should add, definitely add some water. Um, again, just a little bit at a time. But we're doing pretty well here. I'm sure you guys. This is what it looks like so far. So it's kind of a, like a dough. It, there's still some flour in there that needs incorporating, but yeah, this, this flour is really nice because it just incorporates all together really nicely. And you can just do this in the bowl itself right now, since we're just mixing it into like a dough ball. But eventually, right after I get this all incorporated, we're gonna move to a cutting board. And one trick about the ulu flour is that you really have to flour all surfaces that you're working with it on. Otherwise, when you're rolling it out, it'll stick to the pieces that are on the cutting board already. And so it'll be very hard to, to have like nice smooth um, sections of pasta dough to work with. And so cutting it will also be a little bit harder. So well, sur well flowered surfaces are really the way to go with this one. So I'll show you guys here. This is what it looks like. So you can see all the flowers all gone and it's just this dough ball. And so now we're gonna move on to a cutting board and then really um, kneading it by hand. So this is what my cutting board looks like. As you can see, it's very like heavily floured. And when you're kneading it, the dough will absorb a lot of that flour. So if you need to add more water while you're kneading, that's totally fine. Again, very little amounts um, as you don't wanna make it too watery because then you have to add more flour and it's just a big circle. So just a little bit at a time. And then I take this motion. It's, it's the same as like bread. I don't know if any, I've been, any of you guys have made bread, but I kind of just fold it with my palm and push it forward. And then I take my other palm and push it the other way. Um, so it's just that back and forth. This is a little bit of a process. Um, it's not gonna get super smooth. And so we'll still have some of those crevices and cracks, but you're only gonna do this for about a few minutes. And then we're gonna cover it and put it in the fridge to rest. And then um, Auntie Abby's gonna do her recipes, which is gonna be so fun. And then we'll come back and we'll roll out the dough, cut it, and then I'll show you guys a super simple pasta sauce.
to go with it, which I actually made the first time I ever made homemade pasta, which was about, I don't know, like four years ago. It was probably like 12 or something like that. Um, yeah, so super simple sauce. For that, just to let you guys know, you'll need a tomato, onions, garlic, and extra virgin olive oil. And then I'm also gonna use some of the um, herbs from the garden that I picked earlier in CHOP. So it's just parsley, thyme, and oregano. And it's, that's it, it's just super simple. It's a nice sauce so that you can really taste the pasta and really taste all the hard work that you put into making this. Um, yeah, so if you guys have that, that would be awesome. But if not, no worries. Um, so at least you want people to put that dough into a bowl and stick it in the fridge. Is that what you said? Yeah, right after we're finished kneading it, it'll, I'll show you guys, it'll be a bit smoother. And then you just put it in a metal bowl or you can actually even use saran wrap and just wrap the ball itself without a bowl if you need. Um, but I prefer to put it in a bowl just because it's a little, a little nicer. <laughs> just put it in the bowl and then take it out. So we're getting pretty incorporated here. Um, like I said before, it's not gonna be super smooth. That's just not like the way this dough works, but here's a picture of mine. Um, you can see it still has like all these little cracks, which is totally fine. It's not gonna mess up the dough at all. Um, and you just wanna knead it and try and smooth out some of those cracks. And so it's all, just make sure it's really incorporated and you'll know if there's enough water and flour ratio when you can like, I did this without flour in my hands just cause I don't mind it so much. Um, but if you can like touch your palm to it and take your palm away without it sticking, that's pretty much how you know that you have enough like water flour ratio. And if not, if it's sticking to your palm, then you add more flour. I personally use the all purpose flour just cause I see, I feel that's easier to it's like a better, a better flour to make sure it doesn't stick to your hands. Um, but you can totally use it with flour. And then if it's too crumbly still, like if it's not a nice ball or it's like little crumbs, then you need to add more water. So you're looking pretty good here. Um, to make it into a circle, I just kind of flip it upside down and then I push in the middle and fold in all sides. And then I flip it upside down to the top that you want to look nice. And then you just take your two hands and you go in like a circular motion around the dough and it really just creates the nice bottom. Um, and that's what the dough looks like. So this is pretty good. And we're just going to put it in the fridge for about half an hour um, or 20 minutes, depending on how long Auntie Abby's recipe takes. So I just placed it in this bowl and then I have this piece of saran wrap that I used earlier. And I'm just going to cover it and put it in the fridge and then I'll see you guys after and we'll roll it out and cut it. Wonderful, mahalo, okay. So now I'm going to switch it over to, so uh, welcome Hi. again everybody to um, Abigail Am I calling it right? Langley, Langley right? Because it's French. Langless. No, Langless. it's actually German. Oh, it's German. <laughs> okay. Um, another Ulu ambassador working with the uh, Hawaii Ulu Co-op to create recipes. And she owns her own cake works uh, company making cakes. And another hat is you are a <laughs> teacher. You are uh, one of the lecturers at Leeward Community College teaching the right. Arts program. So over to you for yet more delicious recipes with ulu and kabocha. Hello. So um, I haven't done too much stuff with ulu and not overripe ulu. And um, and I was tasked with making something a recipe with ulu and kabocha. So I'm I'm doing two really simple things, but I thought they they actually work really great together. And so the first recipe. It's gonna be a kabucha ice cream. It's a no-churn ice cream, super simple. We're gonna use the um, pumpkin pie spice. You could do your own spice mix if you want, but um, that works really well. Just, you know, kind of get taste like pumpkin pie. We're gonna use some sweetened condensed milk and some 
full 36% heavy whipping cream. So when you whip cream, you, you don't want to, um, you don't want to have it warm when you whip it. So you want to just um, take it right out of the fridge when you're ready to whip it. Um, I'm going to start. And the other thing we're going to use for both recipes is this hand blender. If you don't have a hand blender, you could use a, a regular blender or um, a food processor. Either one will work. Um, for your kabocha, um, I put in the notes that I wanted you to make sure that it's soft. Um, when it comes part cooked from Ulu Cooperative, they're not all pork tender. You want them pretty soft so that um, you don't have crunchy pieces in your ice cream. Okay. Now this 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 kabocha that I got today did not have. I'm I have I'm using the skin. Um, sometimes I don't use the skin. We made uh, kabocha pumpkin pies at Thanksgiving, and I, I took the skin off because it was really green. And you're not going to have a pretty color if the skin's green. The skin's good for you, so it's it's you know um, how you guys were talking about the kabocha earlier. If your kabocha is fully ripened and nice and orange, that's great because then you're going to have a prettier color. Um, Otherwise, you can take the skin off so that you don't have a sort of, you know what, really a brownish color pie or, or ice cream. So first off, just pour my sweetened condensed milk into my kabocha. I hope this works. So I had to, I put my kabocha, I just threw it in the microwave for about eight more minutes with a little water on the top, underneath. Um, but you want it to be cold when you do this because you don't want to fold your whipped cream into a warm substance, right? So if your kabocha is warm and you, you blend up your uh, sweet condensed milk and kabocha, that's fine, but make sure it's cool before you fold in your whipped cream. You just want to blend it. If you have a blender or food processor, just blend it nice and slow. Hand blender will do the same thing. This ice cream recipe is really nice. You could probably use glue in the um, overripe glue in it as well instead of the kabocha. Now I'm using 12 ounces, which is what was in your box from the cooperative. Just to make it simple, keep it simple. If you wanted to use Lulu instead, you can make a Lulu ice cream with that overripe Lulu. I think that would be great too. You'd probably use banana or anything else that you wanted to. Okay. Before I'm done, I'm going to add my pumpkin pie spice. Best recipes are those that taste great and are simple, right? The recipe is too hard, nobody's going to make it. I'm going to put two, te two teaspoons. Now, if you really like, you know, your pumpkin pie spice or you want to add a little more ginger or cinnamon, feel free to do that. You want to make kabocha pie, for example. I just use the standard pumpkin pie recipe and instead of pumpkin puree, just switch it out for the kabocha puree. That's nice. So I'm going to pour this into my bowl. So 
So you can see there's a little bit of um, green flecks in there from some of the green, but there's not a whole lot. And you know, it's, and, and if you don't mind the color, um, then feel free to use all of the green peel, even if they're if it's green, not orange. It's only going to be better for you. Okay. Once you have that ready, I'm going to stick my cream in my mixer with my whisk attachment and just whip it up to soft to medium peaks. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. If you have a handheld mixer, that's great. Um, or if you, you could also use a whisk and whisk it by hand. I grew up on the Big Island in Mountain View. We didn't have electricity for many years while I was growing up. So I did all my baking by hand. Strong muscles. <laughs> totally, totally doable. I'm gonna add a, my vanilla to my whipped cream. You could also add it to this, it doesn't matter. I didn't add it yet, so I'm gonna add it to my whipped cream. So you have an ice cream maker, you can feel free to use the regular ice cream recipe with a creme anglaise. You know, add your kabocha to that and turn it, but a lot of us don't have ice cream makers at home. And I think this is a really great recipe that is so simple. It's delicious with lily koi. I've done it with lily koi, lemon. Um, this is the first time I did it with kabocha, but it came out really nicely. You just want to make sure you don't over whip your whipped cream. If you over whip your whipped cream, it's going to be hard to fold into your base um, because you, when you fold it into your base, it's going to keep it's going to keep whipping a little bit, right? So, so when you're making mousses or folding whipped cream into anything, you just want to make sure you do not over whip it before you. sort of do one third and then two thirds. So the first third is just to sort of um, temper our base so that the next third will, so that the base is more similar texture to the rest of our whipped cream. So rest of our whipped cream. So the other thing is um, you want to make this right a day ahead if you're going to serve it as ice cream on your pancakes. But the other thing is, this is actually really lovely as it is, and you could just serve it as a kabocha with cream on top of your pancakes if you can't wait. You could serve it as kabocha with cream one day and then kabocha ice cream the next day. So as soon as everything is sort of nice and homogenous, we're done. So here it is has sort of a nice texture. You could imagine just putting that right on your pancake. At this point, I would um, give it a little taste. Make sure you like the seasoning. If you wanted to put more pumpkin pie spice or something else, some ginger, you could I also think that if you cut up some candy ginger and threw it in there before you froze it, it would be delicious. But I don't have any today. Okay, I'm gonna put this here, throw it in the freezer, and then I'll bring out one I made earlier for our presentation. Okay, be right back. I'm just gonna throw this in the freezer. Let's see, 
Okay, our milk, our kabocha. I just, I mean, our breadfruit, our ulu. I just cut it up into little chunks to make it easier. This is some flour. I have a little baking baking powder, vanilla. My nutmeg and cinnamon and two eggs. So I'm just gonna take my glue, pour my crack my eggs. Just gonna so like I said, if you don't have, uh, I just thought the hand blender would be easier for this. Um, it's small, but you can use a blender. Um, I'll blend that up before I add the add the flour. You can use a um, a blender or a food processor very easily. So if you really like spice, you know you can always put a little more. Um, but it's not meant to taste super spicy. But it really complements the ulu a lot. Um, a teaspoon of that and a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg. You have to go easier on the nutmeg. But the nutmeg is really good with the ulu. So are you saying caution on the nutmeg, be a little be a little aware about the nutmeg? Yeah, you know, and I think different people have different feelings about nutmeg. Also depends how fresh your nutmeg is. Okay. Other thing I think is that on the milk, I'm gonna have the milk here. I might need more milk. Um, it depends how thick it is. So we're just gonna put it up right here. Now I'm just gonna put in the baking. I was trying to make like a crepe with this, but I don't think the blue is quite enough sensibility like the way wheat flour does, even though I put a little wheat flour in to, to let me do that. You know, it's a little bit hard to turn it. So originally I made the recipe and I'm gonna blend this. I haven't put the flour in yet because I just want to blend it up first. Um, originally, the recipe didn't have any flour. And so if you, you know, if you have a gluten allergy or something, I think you can make it without any flour and then I would cut the milk in half. Um, put less milk, but it's a little bit harder to flip. So I went for a little bit easier. <laughs> you have to have a really nice nonstick pan So I put actually in my original one somewhere between two thirds and a cup of flour um, because it's pretty thick, and uh, I wanted the pancakes to be a little thinner. I think I'm gonna have to add it, and it might depend on your ulu's consistency. Um, maybe if the ulu's riper, I'm not sure I haven't worked with it enough, and maybe then sometimes it's uh, a little more liquidy. But you don't want it super thin either. Just don't touch me. So even though, I mean, I'm fine with flour, but the other thing you could do to make it easier you, if you can't have gluten, is just use a one for one, a cup for cup gluten free flour mix, and that would probably work too, instead of regular flour, depending on your dietary restrictions. So, this is pretty thick still, right? But that's sort of how you want it. And then, you know, as you go, if you think you need a little more um, milk after you've tried one, you can always add a little more milk. So, you can see. Last year, I made a, an ulu lavash with the ulu flour, and that came out really good. And that was kind of same as the pasta. We just did a a one half half ulu flour, half 
regular, actually we use bread flour. Did you say lavash, a lavash? Yeah. yeah. We did that in my, my class. We, had, we did a Thanksgiving menu based on um, local produce and, and stuff. And so the Ulu Cooperative donated us some Ulu flour. Um, and then, yeah, so we did Ulu lavash. Okay, we're gonna turn on our stove. Get. I'm just going to use a scoop, but at home I use a nice big spoon. Awesome. And also, I'm going to use canola oil today, but these are really good with coconut oil. That's what I use at home. I don't have any here. So if you have coconut oil, feel free to use that. I love that on pancakes. It just gives it a, and, and with these, it gives it a, the ulu has such a nice fruity flavor. And then the coconut oil goes so perfectly with it. So you want it to be like when you make pancakes, you want the um, oil to be kind of nice and hot, but you don't want it to be too hot. And I find that you need to wait a little while to let it cook through a bit. So other thing I found, I'm gonna take it up here, face it away from me, but I kind of want to splat it into the pan a little bit so that it gets a little lighter and then let the oil kind of go around it. And I might press it, spread it out a little bit with my spoon. Okay. Then I'm gonna turn it down because I don't want it to get, you know, when you make pancakes, sometimes the first one is, you don't have the pan quite right. You want to make sure you have this nice non skip pan. Okay? Okay, you have to cook it a little while before you can turn it. Turn it. So I guess I find with the ulo, you want to make sure you're cooking it through. So that's why you want to turn it down to nice or medium low heat so that it can take its time, especially on the second side. So I know I'm touching it with my hand, but I'd like to feel how firm it is. When it feels pretty firm, then and, it, and it's golden brown on both sides, then it's ready. So. so Abby, do you think we should switch back to Elise and then come back to you for yeah, your Yeah, that final? would be great. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah? Yeah. All right. Perfect. perfect. So you're ready? All right. So I'm going to spotlight. Yeah. Perfect. Um. So a good note is that you should wash off your cutting board if you were previously using it to knead. Um, you need a really like flat surface that doesn't have any of the previous flour because if any of the little pieces from the dough that we, we needed earlier are on the cutting board, it'll mess it up and you'll have like poopas in your, in your dough. So I would start with a completely brand new clean surface. I just washed this one and dried it real quick. Um, and I also grabbed the dough that we made earlier from the fridge. So it hasn't risen at all. It's the same. It just needs time to rest a little bit so that I get some of that elasticity. Um, so I'll just place it here. And then again, you wanna heavily flour your surface that you're working on. And I just put like, say it was like an eighth of a cup or something like that, maybe a quarter cup. And just kind of make sure that it's all even. Warning, this does get very messy because all the flour gets everywhere. Um, but in front of me, here's an example of how we're gonna roll it out or what it looks like after we've rolled it out. So it looks like this. This is um, half, so this is like one serving. And it's a bit thicker than you probably would think pasta is. And that's just because this ulu flour is very delicate. Um, but this is what it looks like. So I'm just gonna leave this here as like an example and we'll cut that one as well. Um, but this is from the fridge, this is the whole. So I'm just gonna cut it in half because we're only working with half of it at a time because it would be too, too long if we did it all at once. So I just kind of smash it down with my hand after we've cut it. Also, I would recover the other half because you don't want it to have 
Um, you don't want it to dry out. So just covering it very gently just with some plastic or if you have like one of those bowls with a cover, you can just throw the cover on. And then for this, all you'll need is a rolling pin. And if you're using a pasta machine, it'll be a lot easier because you don't have to roll out by hand. But I would heavily flour like both sides of the dough before you put it in the pasta machine, just so it doesn't stick when you're like turning it and like making it nice and long. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna start rolling it out. I also floured my rolling pin right before I did this. So it's all floured, it won't stick to the dough. If it if you feel like it's sticking to your rolling pin, just um, add some more flour to the dough and to the rolling pin if you feel like that's necessary. And then you're just gonna flip it and roll it out. You're kind of going for just like an elongated shape. Um, I would say about 16 inches maybe. See like mine stuck a little bit there, so I'm gonna add some more flour. And it's really cool because you'll actually start to get to see the herbs that are in the dough that we placed earlier, which again is totally optional. So if you didn't, no worries. But if you did, then you get to see it's like laminated, which is really cool. Oops. And then some pieces don't stick as well. So, or stick a little bit. So you might have to, I just use my knife sometimes and just like, scrape it along the bottom if it gets too stuck. And then if it gets stuck, you want to make sure that all those pieces that are still on the cutting board you take off because then it'll stick again. And then you flour it some more. You just make sure it's nice and covered. There you go. And then I just kind of start in the middle and I start to slowly go outwards. It'll start to like go off your cutting board because, or at least if you're using a cutting board. Mine's not long enough. So I just fold that end in and then I work on the back that's not folded. And then I'll switch and I'll go back and forth and you'll fold one in and then open up the other and just stuff like that. Um, it does need quite a bit of flour. So I would have that pretty readily available. It's quite necessary. Oh, and if your cutting board starts to like move around or if it starts to move with your rolling pin, a good trick is to put um, a towel underneath it or a paper towel just so that it has like some friction, I guess, or like something to hold on to on the table. And then we're getting pretty good here. So I like to cut off the ends of aren't so pretty. And then what's really great about using the ulu flour as well is that it's, it melds really well together. So all the ends that we don't need, you can save and you can re like re knead it and roll it out again and you'll have more pasta, which is nice. And it's not as wasteful because I found like when you do like regular pasta with like all flour, um, all purpose flour, it, there's a lot of extras that you have to cut off and it's quite hard to repurpose those ends. So this way you'll be able to, you'll be able to use it, use all your dough. So we're getting pretty good here. This is what it looks like so far and you can see like those laminated pieces of herbs. Um, yeah, so just make sure it's well floured. You shouldn't really be able to see like much of the color. It was just have like a, a white tone on top of it because it'll have the flower. And then you can kind of just place it on top. And then you can do the other half. And for this pasta, I wouldn't recommend cutting it super thin um because it'll it's quite fragile so the thicker it is the more likely that it won't break when we when we cook it so the thicker the better um 
sometimes you can turn it sideways as well if you want to make like the edge. I like to try and make the end like kind of square so that we don't lose length in the noodles when we cut them. So now I have both of the halves all rolled out and they're about the same length. And then you want to make sure that there's flour on top. And then I fold it in half. And if you'd like, you can fold it another time. Just also make sure that that middle section is floured so that when you cut it, they don't stick together. Um, so it looks like that. It should look quite pale just because of all the flour. And then I take my knife and I cut off the edges as little as possible, but as I said, or you can save them and we need them to make more noodles. So I just cut off both the ends on either side um, and then you just cut the length that you want. So I'm cutting about a, a quarter inch to get some nice size noodles. And then I got this really nice pasta drying rack from Christmas. So I just put on my noodles on top um, just so they have some nice time to dry and get ready before we put them in water. Elise, how long do you recommend um, hanging the pasta to dry before we boil them? Um, you don't really need to um, let it fully dry before you boil it. It's only if you're gonna save it, like if you're gonna use it a different day, then it just depends on the thickness, but you can place it out, like today's a really sunny day, so you could just put it outside and probably, it would be dry in like an hour, which would be really cool. But since we're just boiling it pretty soon after we make it, I'm just cleaning it so that none of the noodles stick together. But of course, I don't expect everyone has a pasta wrap, so if you want, you can just, I would use a lot of flour and make sure all the noodles are coated and then you can just place them in like the bowl that we used before or on a, on an oven, oops, an oven rack. No, not a rack, sorry. Oven pan, like, you know, the yeah. sheets. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can just place on those and just make sure that they're super well floured so that none of them stick together. I've definitely had some pastas where I've made it and then at like the final stage they're like all stuck together the worst so heavily floured is very important when coming to pasta I know I've said it like a million times oh while we're doing this you can go ahead and turn on a pot of water to boil them um, I'm just using a smaller pot because this is only a two serving size so it's just a pot it has eight water, eight cups of water, but I'm sure you all have your own pasta pots that you put enough water in, so you'll know. And then I just put a cap on it because it makes it boil faster. Um, and then once that's boiling, you can just throw the pasta noodles in. These are really nice because pretty much all handmade noodles only take 30 seconds to a minute and a half to cook. So these ulu noodles are really nice because it takes very few minutes to cook them. Did you say 30 seconds to a minute? Yeah, it's wow, super that's fast. That's, that's, fast. Much, that's awesome. Yeah, you're pretty much just blanching it. It's super quick. And, and so if you're using a pasta machine, I would recommend not putting it on the angel hair setting because it'll come out much too thin for these noodles and then they'll really just like break apart super easily. Um, and you definitely want them to have some integrity before you put it in the water. So I would definitely go with the linguine or fettuccine size. So these are, like I said before, they're about a quarter inch. So they're quite, they're quite thick. They're about linguine or fettuccine size. <laughs> so there are noodles, they're all hanging right now. And then while we're waiting for the water to boil, we can start on the sauce, if that works. Um, I'm just using a really small pan. So for the sauce, 
sauce, you just need this pan, um, salt and pepper, extra virgin olive oil. I'm using onions and garlic, and then some tomatoes and some herbs from the garden. And I've cut about half an onion, just super small sizes, about, I would say like centimeter, super finely chopped. And then I cut three cloves of garlic, just thinly sliced, and then half a tomato. And I just like cut it pretty small, about the same size as the onion, so they're super tiny. Um, and if you don't have a fresh like tomato, you can totally use diced tomatoes from the can and just cut them a little finer. So for the sauce, I'm gonna get started and turn this on to about medium low. And my stove runs really high. So if you feel like it needs to be hotter, don't don't feel obligated to hold it at medium low. Um, and I'm just gonna throw in quite a bit of olive oil. This is gonna be an olive oil based sauce. Um, since we're not really adding like any cream or anything like that, or eggs. So I would add, I would say I added about like two tablespoons. And you just want to get that, get that going a little bit. And then because garlic cooks so fast, I like to add your onions first and get that going. So it was a little too high, so I turned it down to low. And now you can see we're just gonna sweat the onions a little bit. And once they're pretty much see-through, then we can add, just right before they're completely see-through, we're gonna add the garlic and the tomatoes. But for now, we're just gonna keep it mixing, make sure it doesn't stick to the bottom. There's quite a bit of olive oil on there, so you should be pretty good, it shouldn't stick too badly, and then really just giving that a good mix every 30 seconds or so. So we've got a good color on there. They're pretty yellow. They're starting to get see-through, so we're just gonna add some garlic. And I like it when you can hear it, so I can like keep a good sense on it. So I'm gonna turn it, I turned it down to low because it's getting a little too hot. So I just turn it back up to medium low. So I like to get, it's kind of like a personal choice, but I really like to get my garlic a bit browned. Um, not necessarily burnt at all, but like a good golden brown color. So as you can see, the oil also starts to evaporate and get absorbed by the garlic and onion. So if you need to, you can probably add some more. But as soon as your garlic starts to turn the color that you'd like, I would go ahead and add um, your tomatoes. And you can also add the herbs as well. And it's okay if it doesn't have a lot of liquid because we're gonna add some water from the pasta after we boil it for some thickness. So really just making sure that the bottom is covered with a good amount of extra virgin olive oil is what we're looking for right here. And you can see we're getting this nice color. The tomatoes are there and you can see there's extra virgin olive oil at the bottom. So we're just gonna let that kind of sit a little bit on the stove as we wait for the water to boil. And then just because I love presentation, I saved a little bit of parsley, just like a tiniest little bit, just for right on top of your serving. And then you want to add salt and pepper, a generous amount. Um, the tomatoes are quite sweet, so you kind of want to balance that out with the salt. So I added a good few pinches. And then as much pepper as you'd like. So, now that the water is boiling, you want to heavily salt it. So I would take a, a good like two pinches. 
And then you can start and take um, your pasta from your rack or your bunches and you want to place them in the water, but you want to be very careful that you just don't throw it in. Like you want to separate them slightly before so that the noodles don't stick together while they're cooking. And when cooking noodles or pasta specifically, the 30 seconds after you put it in the water are the most important to make sure that they don't stick. So as soon as you put it in, you pretty much want to mix it. And just very gently make sure that nothing's fall into the bottom or get stuck. And some of them definitely break, especially on the rack, just because there's so much like gravity. So it kind of pulls them apart right at the top. Sometimes they break, and so they'll be like half the size, but that, it won't be all of them. And it's pretty, pretty usual when, when making pasta. So for these, I would give it about a minute just because these are so much thicker. And while you're waiting, you want to occasionally mix it. So I really like the sauce because it's super light and it's really complimentary to the noodles. Um, the, the fresh tomatoes really give it like some very lightness and the onions are a nice um, supplementary flavor. So these noodles are almost done. And then you can try one and see. So the noodles are all done because I just tried one and I tasted it. And you want them to be a little bit al dente, but not too much. And then you want to pour some of your pasta water straight into the sauce. I would say about a quarter cup just for the serving amount. Um, but if I'm making a lot for like six people, I would say add like a solid three quarters of a cup. And then just to save dishes, I just like use the spoon to stop the noodles and then just pour out the water. And then you have your cooked noodles in there and then you can just throw it right back into your saucepan. And here you guys can see, we're just gonna carefully fold this in. They're quite delicate since they're cooked, um, so they'll break apart, but these are a good thickness so that they won't break as part as easily, so you can definitely mix them. That looks amazing. There it is. That's lovely. Wow. Thank you, Elise. But let's finish up with Abby. Thank you. That looks delicious and amazing. I'm hungry now. So, <laughs> but after you eat your pasta, then you can have dessert. You want your dessert? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is my ice cream from, that I made the other day. And I just left it sitting. because It's been in the freezer for a few days. The day after, it's really kind of nice and soft. But after that, it gets a little firmer. So if you let it sit out a little bit um, before you scoop, you'll have a nicer uh, ice cream. So put a nice fat scoop on there. And then same here, I'm gonna put a little mint spray um, oh, before that, but we're not done though. Um, this is delicious with just, uh, this is some really dark maple syrup that I got from Kukua Market here. You could also use a really nice honey. Um, that would be great, but I really like these flavors with the, um, with the cinnamon and the nutmeg and the pumpkin pie spice and the ginger with the maple syrup. So I'm just gonna get a teaspoon of that, drizzle it over. And I found that that really made the dish. That's it. Well, thank you so much, both chefs and Auntie Tammy. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'll Kuka <laughs> 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 <laughs>
kopuna lae. Mahalo ke alo alala. Mahalo ke Mahalo, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. That was lovely. Now go eat your delicious ulu pasta and have a great pancake ice cream dessert. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.